This is Fireside Chat, episode 53, The Third Wheel, recorded September 29, 2014. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're partway through training camp, and we're back for another episode of Fireside Chat. As always, I'm Dan, alongside my co-host Matt. How you doing, Matt? Awesome, as always. Enjoying the training camp so far? Yeah, it's there's been quite a lot of good things to for all Flames fans to look forward to, and some some of the game results haven't been so good, but... But you know what? It really doesn't matter at this point. It's about guys learning and guys getting better, and in the end, it doesn't really matter what the result is. Oh, I know. It's just that you'd like to... No matter what, you want to win, so... As of the time we're recording this, the Flames are sitting at a 3-2 record for regular exhibition games, not including the Penticton tournament or the Dinos game or anything like that. The Flames opened the exhibition schedule with a win over Edmonton. They won in Sylvan Lake against the Coyotes. They had back-to-back losses against the uh, Canucks, unfortunately, and then they came back to win against the Avalanche. Yeah, and the most important thing is seeing who looked good thus far in camp. Who's looked good to you so far? Oh, I thought uh, the player that, the rookie that uh, impressed me the most thus far has actually been Michael Furland. Uh, Sam Bennett and Gaudreau, they come in with, you know, being Johnny Gaudreau and Sam Bennett. But Michael Furland hasn't really garnered a reputation for being an NHL caliber talent. And he's actually emerged into the consciousness of Flames fans, especially after his performance last night against Colorado, where he scored two beautiful goals. I agree with you about uh, Bennett and um, Goudreau. I think that, you know, they're superstars and people are expecting them to come in and look good. And I think that the only thing they could do is go down from where they are. So anyone that was expecting them to look, you know, better i think was confusing themselves but yeah i would agree they've looked about where i expected Furlan looked really good i like uh Furland. i agree with you there another guy that i have on my list here that i've really liked so far is ryan Culkin. Um, i thought Culkin has played better than i expected him to so far and he's come up, i mean he's made a few mistakes as everybody does but i thought he's come up more often than not doing things i didn't expect him to do when i didn't expect him to do them I've noticed him, but in good ways so far. Yeah, both him and his non-biological twin, uh, Brett Kulak, both of them play the exact same way. They've both been surprisingly very good throughout the training camp and even the prospects tournament and everywhere else as well. And it's encouraging when you have players that are former fourth and fifth round selections actually turning into potential players down the road. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, even a guy like Goudreau was selected late and, you know, he's one of the best looking guys. So I definitely, yeah, I totally agree with you there. I think that's a really good sign that we can convert those picks into guys like that. A couple other players that I've been impressed by so far. Um, I've, I've been impressed the little bit that we've seen from Reinhardt. Um, he had some good games. He's had some bad games. But overall, I've been impressed by what I've seen with him. And on the defensive side, I've been impressed by what I've seen from Diaz. I was not expecting much from him. And the little bit that we've seen of him, I think he's looking good. He, Yeah, I can agree with that. I think like guys like Reinhardt and Arnold and... Agostino, like, they've all looked good at times and, you know, not so good at others, but they're making progress towards becoming NHL talent, even if they might not have spots here in Calgary. On the other side of the coin, who's disappointed you so far, or who were you expecting more from and didn't get it? Well, the there was two players that I was expecting a lot more for just due to their level of experience and their age. And that was Mark Kondari and Ben Hanowski in the Vancouver game in Calgary. Uh, I repeatedly noticed that 
Kandari would always seem to make the less than optimal decision when he had the puck, and it would cause scrambliness in his own end. Like, he didn't necessarily turn the puck over or blatantly screw up, but it's the little things that, you know, if you have a skilled forward, they might be able to knock the puck off your stick and then you're screwed. So, yeah. Uh, And when you're the oldest of our defensive prospects, I do believe, you know, you should be showing that, like, you're ready to step up if necessary, and I didn't see that at all. And similarly with Ben Hanowski, he was just there and didn't show any improvement over last year. So, those two disappointed me. I agree with you about Kandari. Um, I've been a Mark Kandari fan since before the Flames acquired him. I mean, I never thought he was the best defenseman in the league, but I always thought he could be a serviceable number seven guy, potentially a future, you know, full-time NHLer in a lower role, almost like a Chris Russell type role. But yeah, I've been really disappointed by what I've seen from him so far. Um, but, you know, if you look at his career, he's played uh, four, eight. He's played about eight NHL games in his career, and that's probably why. I mean, this guy, I think, is a career AHLer, and I think this year he's just establishing again that his spot is in the AHL. Yeah, somebody that can fill in here and there if you get injuries, but it, like a lot of players, completely replaceable. It's unfortunate because you always wish for the best for your players, but, you know, it's up to them to step up, and I don't think he's managed to do that. Uh, Speaking of uh, older defensemen, I forgot to mention in the players that have looked good, I have to give a special shout-out to John Ramage because he has looked very impressive thus far, and he has taken steps forward. And I'm hoping that he continues that to one day become an NHL defenseman. That that would be really, really good. I, I've liked Ramage since we drafted him. I think he's got a good mix of grit and, you know, all the other skills you need at that level. So, yeah, I would I would like to see him... Uh, I, I'd like to see him make it at some level, maybe not full-time NHLer, but, you know, a call-up guy somewhere down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, another guy that I have not been too impressed with, there's a couple of them. Um, I have David Wolf on my list. I don't know what I was expecting from David Wolf, but we really didn't see much there. He had some kind of flashes of some offensive ability, but nothing huge. And I guess, you know, coming in, I didn't know what to expect from him, but considering how big of a guy he was, I guess I was expecting a little bit more. And also Brandon Bolig. Um... There was some talk that he, you know, he might be turning a new leaf and getting more offensive, and I really don't see much from him so far. So, some guys there I'm disappointed with. As far as young guys, uh, that disappointed me a little bit. We talked last week about Jason Fram coming in. He obviously didn't get signed and got cut, so that was a little bit disappointing because I thought he was worth the uh, spot. And I agree with uh, you. I think um, Hanowski for sure. I would also sort of put. Um, Kenny Agostino on that list. I think Agostino's been playing hard, and maybe it's just the caliber of guys he's with, but he hasn't looked as good as I thought he might look this year. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from, but to expect him to be a top six forward in the NHL, I think, is a little bit overly optimistic. Like, I I think if he ever does make the NHL on a full-time basis... It'll be more as a serviceable third, fourth line guy. Oh, for sure. And maybe that's the thing. Maybe it's just the players he's been on the ice with have overshadowed him so far, so he really hasn't got to show his stuff. Yeah. Well, the Flames likely have one of the top five forward groups for prospects, so, you know, it's hard to show that like you're amazing when you've got guys like Granlin, Berchi, Gaudreau, Bennett, Monahan, on and on and on. So Yeah, exactly. Another guy I think I'll add to the list too that we talked a little bit about last week was uh, Mason McDonald. 
Um, I was expe- I know he's only 18. People have given me a hard time on Twitter, but I was expecting a little bit more from him considering how high he was drafted. And I was a little bit disappointed by what we were seeing from him in camp. I think some of the goaltenders that were walk-ons like um, uh, Brad Th- Thyssen and Doug Carr were doing better than he was at camp. Well, uh, anytime you have a young goaltender, uh, the positioning is usually the last thing that goaltenders get down. And McDonald does have it down mostly, so... Yeah, he wasn't very good, but, you know, it, he has things to work on. If he's still this performing this poorly in three or four years, then you can get worried. But, you know, just got to be patient. I think, to me, a lot of it is they may have disappointed us this year for whatever reason, but a lot of it's going to be what do we see from these same players next year? And are they able to make a stride forward? And in a rebuild, that's what you have to be able to do. Yeah, and especially with a guy like Mason McDonald, he knows that, okay, the shots are coming at you a little faster. They're coming from this angles versus these ones that I normally would face in junior. So, you know, and he can make those adjustments. So, you know, and he has stuff that he can work on over the course of the year. And whether he learns it or not, that will determine a lot of things moving forward. But unfortunately, we got to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the thing, too, to remember, is these guys aren't just, you know, released from camp and cast off. They're given a long list of things they need to work on. And I think by, you know, the coaches are going to say, hey, did this guy take what we asked him to work on and work on it? And even if it's not 100%, if he's showing forward movement, that's what they really want to see. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think I think we're pretty much in agreement then about who we think was good, who we think was bad. I didn't see any of the, I guess, NHL guys, the guys that I think we can all probably guess are going to be on the roster, um, that looked really horrible, which I think is a good thing. I'm glad that, you know, there's nobody stinking up the joint. Um, yeah. But it's, it's mostly these call-up and kind of edge guys. Yeah, well, that's typical for a training camp that the some of the young players might struggle a bit so you know at least uh, you didn't see like say like yuri hoodler being absolutely terrible or something like that so exactly yeah yeah that's what i was worried about is coming in seeing one of the nhl guys just looking really awful which we didn't see so that's good yeah um Unless there's anything you want to talk about as far as the players and who look good and bad, I figure why don't we move on and talk about some of the guys that the brass obviously didn't like because they've been cut. Yeah, sure. Um, So as everybody knows, we had a huge training camp this year. I think this is one of the biggest training camps I've ever seen from any team. The Flames had a lot of walk-on guys, a lot of guys on AHL deals with Adirondack, and it was a huge camp. And we knew that cuts were going to come fairly quickly and fairly often, and they have. I don't know if this is an exhaustive list because there's been so many cuts, but if we go through the list um, of who we have, at least over the last couple days, I'm sure there's more here. And Matt, maybe you've got some more. Uh, Jason Fram got released. So he wasn't signed. Uh, Trevor Gillies, Ben Hanowski, Matthew Tusignet, uh, Bryce Van Brabrandt are all sent down to the HL. Curtis Jettig, I've never even heard of. I don't know where he comes from. Uh, he was a former draft pick of the Flyers that he okay. didn't get signed and got picked so up. So he's walk on. Yeah. Or or is he one of our fifty contracts? I think he was signed to an AHL deal. Okay. Uh, Kenny Agostino, Garnet Hathaway. I think Hathaway's an AHL deal too, isn't he? AHL, which I was actually. Yeah, I was shocked with Hathaway not getting an NHL contract, but he is with Abbotsford. And he was actually quite impressive and earned the actual contract, which was good. That is, yeah, and that's what you want, is guys that are fighting and earning those deals. David Wolf got sent down, which we predicted last week. Uh, Dustin Stevenson. Doug Carr got sent down. I'm glad to see that Doug Carr is going to stick around for a while because I believe he's still a walk-on guy. I don't think he's signed any sort of deals yet. I honestly don't know. 
So nice to see him go down. Um, Brad Thyssen, who everybody has already pegged as the backup goaltender in uh, Adirondack. Turner Elson, Emil Poirier, Ryan Culkin, John Ramage all got sent down. And then sent to uh, their respective junior teams were Austin Carroll and Keegan Kanzig. And Mark Kandari also got sent down, but was placed on waivers on the way down. So we talked earlier about how we didn't like what we saw from Kandari. Would you be at all choked if he got claimed by somebody? Honestly, I don't see why anybody would. But, you know, if somebody wants him, fine. See you later. Uh, you know. At this point, I could see somebody taking him and perhaps saying, hey, we need some ECA or some uh, AHL depth, I mean. This guy might fit in there. Yeah, it depends on like if teams have contract spots available and all that, which honestly, I, I could see that them trading Kandari for another AHL contract, maybe. Didn't they do something like that last year? Yeah. They traded him within the AHL for somebody? Yeah, uh, for Corey Locke, I do believe. So, yeah, like something like that. Or even if you're trading up like an NHL contract for an NHL contract. Sort of like uh, Nemus for um, West Garth, that type of thing. Not to that scale, but something along those lines. You know, even if, I mean, even if Kandari is in the minors this year, and I don't know if they would go this far, but we're going to have a lot of good defensemen in the AHL this year. He might even be a guy, if the Colorado ECHL team is doing well, that you might drop down there for some veteran leadership. I could see that. Um, you know, and have him work his way back up. But, yeah, I don't think anyone's going to take him. But to me, if somebody wants him and he's dangled on waivers, I'd say let them have him. I wouldn't, you know, spend I, – I wouldn't spend a lot of time fretting if he left this team. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those things where it it's not really going to impact anything adversely. Like, you could just go and claim some other guy – if you really needed to, or sign Yonkman or one of the other uh, walk-on free agent defensemen and just send them down. Yeah. No, he, I think Kandari, the only reason they waived him is because he's over the age of waivers, right? They didn't waive him yeah. trying to get someone to pick him up. They had to waive him on the way down? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. So it's not like they're dangling him for somebody to take or because he's being punished. This is something that they have to do by league rules. Exactly. That's what I thought. I just wanted to double check. So, yeah, I think some people, including myself, was kind of hoping that Mark Kandari would make a bid for a roster spot this year. But I think if you look around at the players in the depth chart, I think that he is still very low on that depth chart to make a full-time appearance, even to make a much of a call-up appearance. I agree. And that's part of the problem is the Flames are starting to get players coming up through the system that are... Passing him, guys like Sealoff, Waterspoon, Kulak, Culkin, plus any of the free agent signings. So, you know, you have to stand out in order to make a mark, and he hasn't really. Well, and the nice thing is, I believe this is the last year of his contract. So, you know, it gives him one more chance to make a mark, and the Flames don't have to renew him. And honestly, I think if he doesn't make a mark even at the AHL level this year, I think he might be done as far as NHL contracts go in the future. Yeah, I could see him going to Europe if things don't work out this year. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. He might be a guy, and you never know, maybe he goes over to Europe and he has some very successful years and comes back, but yeah, I think if things don't work out this year, he's on his way over to Europe. Yeah. So for his sake, I hope it works out for him. Well... The, you know, if you go going to Europe, at least you can have some excitement for getting to travel to various places. I think they get paid pretty well over there, too. Yeah, so it's not all bad. No, but I think, you know, anyone who's a pro hockey player would probably rather play, if, especially if you're a North American-born guy, you'd probably rather play in the North American leagues. True. I, I mean, I can't speak for him. I've never talked to him, but I can imagine that, you know, if you're playing in the Swiss League, you'd rather be playing in the AHL because that's more of a prestigious league. But, yeah, we'll see what happens with him. I think, you know, sometimes a contract year is a great time for players to redeem themselves. So we'll see what happens with him. Not that he's, you know, in the NHL, but maybe there's the push he needs 
there's a new coach in the HL. There's lots of changes going on. Maybe he'll just excel. Who knows? Yeah, and that's why we have to wait and see with a lot of these guys because you just n- don't know who exactly will step up and take those roster spots. It's the part of it's all part of the fun of being in a rebuild. You know, really, it is, and I love that. It's kind of watching these guys excel and not having to worry about um, how we're doing or you know, oh, this putting this guy in the roster might cause us some issues or anything like that. You get that chance. Just relax and watch guys develop. Yeah, exactly. Like if the Flames call up, say, Berchi or Goudreau or whomever, and they have struggles in the NHL, oh well. You know, it's yeah, not it's like not the like Flames you're gonna say, are going to Oh no, be... this guy's going to cost us the playoffs. Yeah, exactly. It's not like we're going to be anywhere near that likely this season. So, you know, if they make mistakes, that's fine. That's how you exactly. learn. And that's one of the nice things about having the the roster and the position where we are right now is that we get that option. Trilliving was on the radio today on Fan 960. We've been hearing from him a lot lately with various different media scrums and stuff. But one of the most interesting things I think we both said that came out of it, a lot of it was your standard stuff that you hear of, you know, calling on your own guys and talking about how Bennett and... Uh, and um, Goudreau are looking good. Not that's not worth talking about, but he, you know, that's the standard rhetoric. But one thing they did say that was interesting is that the Flames have been looking at going after some of the guys that have been put on waivers so far. And there's already, I think, a handful, maybe seven or eight guys um, that are on waivers. And Matt, you picked out some guys that you thought uh, the Flames might go after from the list. I think you're probably right there. Uh, one is Stefan Elliott from Colorado. Uh, a defenseman, and one is Philip Samuelson from Pittsburgh, also a defenseman. We have a lot of defensemen in the system already, especially older defensemen and guys on tryout. If you had the option to say sign a Yonkman or a Diaz or one of the guys that's at camp or bring in Elliot or Samuelson, what would your choice be? Well, my first choice would definitely be to acquire the younger defensemen off waivers and try them out instead now that's not to say that guys like diaz and yonkman and the rest haven't been decent out there it's just with the rebuild you do need to have good young talent and because the flames are gonna be somewhat lousy this year Having a guy like a Stefan Elliott or a Philip Samuelson coming in through waivers, you can give them a 20 to 30 game addition in the NHL, see what they have. If they actually emerge, well then you've gained a awesome free asset and it's not like we are flush with a ton of great defensive prospects at the moment. So why not? It if you don't get them off of waivers, then, you know, by all means, go sign Diaz or Yonkman or Brookbank or whomever. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, if we look at the ages on these guys, Stefan Elliott's 23, Philip Samuelson's 23, Diaz is 28, Brookbank is 33. So I think if we're rebuilding, bringing in the younger assets, and then another guy that we mentioned was Jonathan Blum, um from Minnesota, Minnesota who's tw- who's 25. So all younger players, I think, in this team, we need younger guys, and it gives them time to develop, too. Um, I think most of these guys are on a one- or two-year deal, so if they don't work out, it's not like we're going to be stuck with them for seven years. Yeah, exactly. And like with Colorado and Pittsburgh, like each of them has pretty much a set defense core, more or less. And not really a lot of room for somebody that's decent but unspectacular to come in. Which both of Elliot and Samuel said they're okay. But like, don't expect them to come in and be the next TJ Brody. But if they can come here where their competition's a little bit easier, they might actually be pushed and emerge because defensemen do take a little bit longer sometimes to develop somewhat like goaltenders so you don't really know until you get there 
Yeah. I think, too, if you look at the success the Flames had last year with young defensemen, I'm thinking mostly uh, Russell. I would put Russell in the same boat as a lot of these guys. He was a younger defenseman that a lot of teams I don't think would have given the time of day to. We had to acquire him by trade, but I don't think he was high on anybody's list. And he came in here and excelled in a new position under new management. And especially a guy like Elliot or Samuelson, I could see almost doing the same thing. Exactly. And if they come in and they're not good, then you can just wave them again and, oh well, at least you tried. Well, but at the same time, this whole team is no good this year. I mean, it's not like, you know, we're bringing in a guy to a playoff contention team who has to be good right away or we get rid of him. Like, yeah, you could waive them. I think whoever we bring in will be a seventh defenseman anyway, so probably isn't going to get a lot of play time. So, you know, I think, yeah, it gives you a lot of options there. It's not like we're trying to fill a top four slot. Exactly. And that's pretty much a mark of a rebuilding team anyways to get some decent but unspectacular guys like, say, Joel Colborn from last year and slot them in and see if they can actually emerge into something useful. If not, yeah. then you just wait for the your own draft picks to come in and take those spots. So, And what I like most about these guys is we don't have to pay for them. Like We had to give up a draft pick for Colborn. We had to give up a draft pick for Russell. Exactly. These guys are free, essentially. Exactly. So why not? If you can pick up a guy for free, why not bring them in? Yeah, and it's not going to hurt. Plus, they're young, so I don't see a downside, really. I think the worst thing that could happen is you bring one in, he's no good, you wave him, you send him to the A, and then at the deadline you flip him for a sixth. Now we've got value from nothing. Well, even if you don't get an asset for him, at least you're trying something, you know, to improve yeah. the team. Exactly. Worst Let case them scenario walk at the end of the year the, or something like that. Yeah. Worst case scenario is the guy doesn't do anything for you positively, and then you wait out the end of his contract and you let him go. Yeah. But you got guys like Kandari, for example, that you're going to basically be doing the same thing with. So why not see if they have something? Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it is we have to experiment at this point. Yeah. We have to try new things and new guys. And if they don't work, well, at least we can say, you know what, we tried it. And if you get something, it's good. For sure. So at this point in the season, the waiver order goes by last year's finishing order, right? Yes. So Florida would have first right of refusal, then Buffalo, then Edmonton, then us. And if you look at the rosters of each of the three teams below us, they do not have any spots for defensemen at all, especially Buffalo. So we're pretty much the only team of the top four that has a spot open or two. And these guys are all in waivers for 24 hours, right? Yeah, so we'll know tomorrow, and I do believe at noon Eastern, whether or not okay. we have a new addition. And now I, I've always, I've never really known how waivers work. You can only pick up one guy at a time, right? You couldn't put in a claim for all these guys. I believe you can only claim one guy who's on waivers at a time. Mm, I don't know. I think you could just, like, if you want to go nuts and claim six guys i think you could but i'm not a cba i'm expert. only basing my experience off the uh east side hockey manager game and who knows how realistic that is but there you can only claim one guy at a time so i don't know but yeah i don't i have guess a, i guess we'll find I'm out i'm not a cba expert so if anybody knows tweet us because i think we'd both be curious to know so if there was one guy from this list elliot samuelson or blum that you would go after uh, who would it be if you had to put in a waiver claim for only one? It would be, without a doubt, Stefan Elliott, just because he does have a good slap shot and he's quick on his feet. He He's not as good defensively. How would you say, to compare him to some of the walk-on guys, he's more of a Rafael Diaz type than a Sheldon Brookbank type, where Samuelson's more Brookbank than... Diaz. And Elliot is also a right-handed shot. Yeah, the Flames talked a lot going into this offseason about how they wanted more right-handed shots in the blue line. 
So yeah, I, I I think that there'd be some temptation to pick up um, Samuelson from a lot of teams because he comes from Pittsburgh, which is a winning team. But I agree with you. If he was, if it was him or Blum, I'd pick up Samuelson. But with Samuelson or Elliott, I think I would also lean towards Elliott. You can't go wrong either way. Yeah, well, that's why I was wondering if you can pick up two of them because you could always pick up two. I mean, they're both making less than a million, and we got tons of money to work with. And, you know, let them fight it out for the seventh spot. Well, additionally, you could have, say, one of them, like Samuelson, also draw in as a forward if necessary as well, just to get playing time. Has he done that? Does he have experience as a forward? I don't think so, but usually uh, sometimes defensive defensemen can go up as, like, the 12th or 13th forward type. I think that if we're going to draw someone in, we have so many guys I'd rather bring up from the AHL to oh, give yeah. a shot than bring a defenseman I in I know. There. That's only if you put claims in on both and you end up getting both. And, you know, you can't re-put them on waivers, I don't think, for like 30 days. So. Yeah. They'll figure it out. I mean, you could always run one less forward for, you know, the first month or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, the well, we'll see. It'll be interesting. But I'm glad the Flames are shopping the waiver market because sometimes I think the waiver market is underutilized in the NHL, especially by teams like the Flames that have money. If you can pick somebody up for free, why not? Exactly. Worst case scenario is you just picked up somebody that won't really help that much, and you burned a contract spot for the season. Which okay. <laughs> And we're what, like 43 contracts, right? 43 or 44. I'm not sure. Okay, so for those that for those that don't know, under the CBA, any franchise can only have 50 players under contract. That doesn't include guys that sign an AHL deal with your AHL affiliate. But you only have 50 guys signed to one-way or two-way deals with the NHL club or playing in junior. So anyone that signs an, uh, a deal or the team maintains the rights to... You can only have 50 of them. And I think for a couple of years, we were butting right up against that 50. Well, I think if uh, you got a junior player going back to juniors, their contract doesn't count. But if they've signed a contract, it, it does, doesn't, doesn't count. Like, if you don't sign it them, it slides. Really? Yeah. That's why, like, if, say, like, we sent Bennett down, even though we've signed him, like, his contract doesn't count. See, because I've never understood the point of signing a guy if you're just going to send him down then. Because yeah, I just thought it counted that, as one of your contracts. That's why. Okay. Interesting. So then it'd be NHL guys who are on a one-way or two-way deal. What if you have a guy whose rights you maintain, but he's playing in Europe? That would count too, wouldn't it? Yes. That's what I thought. Okay. And I don't think we have any of those this year, do we? No. Well, it's sort of like what happened with St. Louis having Red O'Bara's rights, even though... He wasn't under contract with them at the time. Right. Yeah. Because I know the Flames had to carry Giordano's rights the year he went over to Russia for that same reason. He wasn't signed, but they wanted to retain... They could have released the rights, but then anybody could have signed them. But they wanted to retain the rights, so he counted it as a contract. So, yeah, if we've got 42 or 43, you could definitely bring one or two of these guys in, even. Yeah, and it wouldn't hurt at all because you'd still have like four or five roster spots anyway yeah and that's that's perfect and just as a note for flames fans um st louis today waived chris butler as well so the former flame who's now playing for the blues has been waived i have a feeling that they're not just waving him to dangle him i think he's on his way to the ahl which probably for him a little bit disappointing going from you know being with the flames to going to the ahl at kind of sh- says some perhaps about his talent level the flames should claim him only just to piss luke off <laughs> there'd be a lot of people that be that would be upset if the flames all of a sudden went and claimed him again <laughs> it'd be funny though oh it probably would be but i think especially on uh, some of the online forums like calgary puck you'd have a riot oh yeah i think people would you know just riot there um, but yeah, I, th- I think it's an interesting note that Chris Butler's on waivers already uh, on his way to the AHL. Well, it, a team like St. Louis, they they have a really good defense core, so it was kind of inevitable that he was heading to the AHL because 
you just look at the talent they have, and he wasn't going to surplant any of them. So... And, you know, maybe he's a guy like Kandari who needs a year to really show what he can do. Um, not saying that he's, you know, in the same league as Kandari. I think that he's probably, I mean, he's shown that he's been in the NHL more than Kandari, but maybe this is a put-up or shut-up year to show that he can, you know, maintain his position and make it back to the NHL. I think he'll be a first call-up or a first couple call-ups for uh, St. Louis. Definitely. Well, Matt, I thought we'd do some fun. We've talked about this in advance. Um, as we're coming down to the last week here of training camp with the last couple days, why don't we talk a- about who we both think will be on the opening day roster? We're not talking about, you know, roster at the end of the season or anything like that, but who we think will be on the Flames' opening day roster. And we uh, haven't seen what each other's going to say yet, so this will be our first time listening to this. But we did put a restriction on ourselves. We said that we had to have a 23-man roster for opening day. And we broke that down. 14 forwards, 7 defensemen, 2 goalies. We're not going to talk about line combinations or anything like that. Just the players we think are going to make the NHL roster and be wearing a flaming C come opening day on October 8th. Why don't I start with my roster? And then uh, we can comment on it and then hear yours if that works for you. Uh, Just do the forwards first. Sure. All right, so my forwards, I think, will be in there. Again, I'm not going by lines or anything like that. I'm just going by players I think will be on the team. Uh, Mason Raymond, Sean Monahan, and Yari Hoodler. Michael Backlund, Joel Colborn, and Curtis Glencross. Sven Berchi, Matt Stajan, and Michael Furland. Uh, Lance Boma, Brian McGratton, and Brian Bolig. And lastly, David Jones and uh, Devin Setaguchi will be the, the alternate forwards, I think. Okay. Well, most of my list is the same with Raymond, Monahan, Hoodler, Backlund, Colborn, Glenn Cross, Stajan, Bullig, Boma, McGratton. Where I differ is I think that the Flames will keep both Berchi and Furland as well as uh, Paul Byron and Sam Bennett. I th- You think Bennett will stay? Yes. Even if it's only for nine games. You know, like I, it's not like the full season or anything, but I think he's done enough where he gets the nine-game edition and then goes back. I don't think they do the nine-game edition at the beginning of the year. I don't disagree with you, but I think that they'll probably bring him in near the end for the nine-game edition. No, you can't. If, if you can you, bring them up anytime. No. It, a rookie like that, you have to send to juniors. You can't recall them. Because didn't we do that with Sven? We brought him up for like uh, nine That games was or a weird exception due to the fact we had like 15 injuries or something like that. Oh, okay. And we had nobody else so for left wingers, so that's why we were able to do that. Okay. So you don't really think that um, Bennett's going to stay here all year? You just think he's going to get the first nine games and then he'll be on his way back to juniors? It He could stay all year, but I think that they'll just give him the nine and send him back. On my roster, I was, I was debating between a couple names here. Um, I think f- I wanted to put Reinhardt on my roster, but I think he's injured right now. So I don't think he'll be on the opening day roster. I think Furland has shown enough that he could stay here. I also debated about Setaguchi, but I think Setaguchi's going to start here at least and ha- will have to earn his way into the lineup. Yeah. But with two extra forwards, I think he'll be watching a lot of games from the press box. Yeah. Well, I actually put both David Jones and Devin Setaguchi as heading to Adirondack. I haven't seen enough from either of them that they should deserve a roster spot. With the Flames having as many good young forwards, you can't just have the the mediocre veteran take the spot just because they're a mediocre veteran. Unless you're kind of intentionally, unintentionally trying to tank, but I, you know, I, If you're going on a meritocracy, I just don't see how a guy like David Jones or Devin Setaguchi is better than Sven Berchi or Michael Furland. 
I agree with you there. I think Berchi and Furlan make the lineup anyways. And I think as much as you're probably right that if we were to look at the rosters we think we'll see on closing day of the season, I don't think I'd have Jones and Setaguchi on that roster. I think they'll start here. And those spots, as we talked about last week, I think those spots are theirs to lose. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the guys in Adirondack are going to say, see these two players? These are the guys you got to knock out to make it to the NHL. Mm Mm-hmm. I can see so that. So I think they'll, to me anyways, I think they'll be wearing a flaming C on opening day, um, and those will be their spots to lose. And the Flames can afford to put Jones's big contract down in the AHL this year, so I don't think he's perhaps as safe as he might be with other organizations. But yeah, I think they'll start those guys there. If nothing else, I think you don't sign Setaguchi, just send him to the AHL. I think they're going to want to see what this guy's got. I know. I It's one of those things that, I can understand if they keep Jones and Setaguchi. It's just, I'd prefer the kids to play. That's all. Yeah, and and I think too, if we look at it, I think Jones and Setaguchi will probably be the two guys sitting in the press box, and that's not where I want the kids to be. So True. if two guys are going to sit in the press box, those guys are great guys to sit in the press box and wait for somebody else to get hurt and bring a kid up then. True. Because bringing somebody, Reinhardt, on the road to sit in the box, I'd rather he plays in Adirondack. Can't argue with that. Uh, let's move to the blue line. I bet this one will be pretty much the same for both of us. Um, I'll give you my blue line picks. So, again, not looking at pairings or anything, just who I think will be on the blue line. I think Giordano, Brody, Smeed, Weidman, Russell, and England are locks in that position. Um, if you would have asked me a, a week ago, I probably would have said that Corey Potter would be the seventh defenseman, which they'll carry. But now I think the seventh defenseman is either going to be Rafael Diaz or whoever they pick up from waivers this week. So that was kind of thrown in last minute. So I think Diaz or Elliot slash Samuelson, whichever one of those two they pick up. Yeah, and I can't argue with that. Uh, you know, it's the exact verbatim picks that I had. I wanted to try and find a way to put Seeloff in there, but I just, I because I like Seeloff and I think he deserves the shot, but I can't see who he's going to knock off from that top six. Well, Seeloff did come off of that big injury last year. He would probably be better served on, at least for half the season, at, at least, being in the AHL and getting his stamina back up and used to playing every day. Because, you know, missing a year, it's hard to get your everything back 100%. So Yeah. And if you look a year ago, we didn't have Smeed in there either, and that's where I think there was some uh, wiggle room last year. True. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I wanted so badly to try and find a place for him, but I think that the right... Um, the right place for him is Adirondack, at least at the beginning of the year. Yeah, and if the Flames do suffer some injuries on the defense score, I would assume that both Waterspoon and Sealoff would be right there, ready to step in. Yeah, I agree, and I think that's the nice thing, is we know who the first couple call-ups are. Um, Waterspoon and Sealoff, I think both I'd call up either one, depending on what you're looking for, that sort of thing. But yeah, I think those two are the shoe-ins for the first call-ups. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving to the net, I don't think we're probably going to have any uh, any disagreement here. I think Hill or Ramo have the net locked up in Calgary this year. Undoubtedly. Oh, Yanni Ordeo's looked good, but I don't see him taking Ramo out. And I also don't see Ramo clearing waivers if we tried to send him to the farm. No. Yeah, that would just so be a waste to, of an asset, really. Yeah, well, you'd have to trade him, and I think there'd be some trade value to him, but I think you'd have better trade value at the end of the year. Yeah, his so contract I, is I up at the end of the year So with Ramo, so if he has a decent season and they're not want, wanting to keep him for some reason, he has a UFA at the end of the year, so they could trade him hypothetically. But you wouldn't get anything now if you wanted to. And, I mean, if we look at things in the scheme of the NHL, Ramo is an expensive backup. And that's the only reason I think they might not re-sign him. If you look at, you know, him comparatively and what he's making compared to Hiller, 
Um, I think he's an expensive backup. But let's talk about that. Who do you think... Do you think we have a starter this year? Do you think we have a 1A, 1B? How do you think things shake down between the twine? I think that uh, it's going to be for probably the first 10 or so games will be a 1A, 1B, and I think Ramo takes the starting position. Unless Hiller really steps up his game, he has been quite disappointing thus far, in my opinion, from the three or four times I've seen him. So, you know, it. I would prefer... It's like last year, how I was somewhat encouraged by Red O'Bara's play. I've been encouraged by Ramos' play. And similarly with Hiller, Ordeo last year at the beginning of the year was kind of wishy-washy. So things can change. But for now, I'm leaning Ramo as the starter. Yeah, I remember that Ordeo started in the ECHL last year. Mm-hmm. And... In the training camp, uh, it was somewhat similar overall between what Hiller did this past week versus Ordeo last year. So, haven't been overly impressed with Hiller thus far. It, yeah, it it can change. So, if you were the coach, who would you put out for the home opener? Without a doubt, Kari Ramo. You'd start Kari Ramo? Mm-hmm. Yes, Hiller is the big contract guy, but you have to go with the player that, you know, it has the better opportunity to get you the win at the end of the day. And from what each have shown thus far, Ramo has been better. So uh, he would be my guy. And, you know, I mean, I don't follow the Ducks all that closely. I don't know how Hiller generally looks in uh, camp. Some guys just don't look good every year in camp, so I don't know what Hiller's tendencies are there. But I I disagree with you thinking that Hiller's going to get the first shot in net simply because of his contract. I think that he's being looked at as the starter. I think he's the experienced guy. And I think it's Ramo's job to win from him. But I agree with you that by the end of the year, I think Ramo will be, um, even by Christmas, I think Ramo will take the starting role. I just think that they're paying Hiller too much to be the backup. And I think that he he's kind of brought in with a certain expectation in mind. True, but uh, uh, one thing a lot of Flames fans have to realize is that uh, this current Jonas Hiller, ever since he had suffered that vertigo issue hasn't really been the same guy that he was before the vertigo issue like two three years ago and because of that his stats have been a lot less good and like i i do believe uh kari ramos stats last year were actually better than hiller's and hiller played for the ducks and ramo for us so that's not very good you know, and if that becomes the case, that Hiller becomes the backup, then he becomes a very expensive backup. Well, have to hit the cap floor somehow. Let's see, Ramo played uh, 40 games, uh, 2.65 goals against average for with a .911 save percentage. Hiller played for Anaheim 50 games with a 2.48 GPA, so he was better, or GAA, I mean, so he was better in the GAAs, and they had the exact same save percentage. So, you know, one of them played more games. You could break it all down, but I think it's pretty even just by looking at those stats. Yeah. But looking at the teams that were in front of each of the goalies, you would expect uh, Hiller to have better stats. Oh, for sure. But we all know that Hiller had a bad year, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that we're going to see the the one thing I think we will see from Ramo is the typical thing in contract year. I think he will probably play better this year than he probably will for a number of years because it's a contract year. So I think we might see a lot out of him because that of that. But my big issue with him, based on last year, I don't know if he's just streaky or if it just took him a while to get going. But he was good at the beginning. He sucked for a number of months. Um... Barra took over the net, then he came back strong again. So I don't know if he's just streaky or if he just needed some time to get going in North America. 
Well, he did have an ankle injury right at the beginning of, year, of the year, and he didn't really have any time off until he suffered that injury that knocked him out for a month, and that caused his ankle to get better, and after that he was lights out, so maybe it was the ankle causing him some issues, I don't know. Could be. You know, either way, though, we got two great goaltenders. I think, as I said last week, we have one of the best tandems in the NHL as far as goaltenders. I think either guy can be relied on. So there's not going to be a night when we put the backup in, and it's like when McElhaney was here. Or Joey McDonald, or... Joey McDonald, yeah, and you go, oh, crap, that guy's in that tonight. I think either way, we're going to have a strong goaltender. Exactly. It The loss, if we lose, it won't be because the goaltender was terrible. At least most of the time. I do think that, uh, I mean, everybody has a bad night from time to time, but yeah, it's not because they're poor goaltenders. It's because they'd be having a bad night or a bad team in front of them. Mm -hmm. Another player that I had here in kind of a bubble position when I made my rosters is Brandon Bolake. Do you think Brandon Bolake, he's making $1.25 million this year. Do you think he remains a flame all year? Yeah, and the main reason is... uh... He more or less replaces what Westgarth did last year as the second fighter in case McGratton's out for some reason, whether it's because he's already in the penalty box or otherwise. So yeah. so do you think Bolig slots in the lineup regularly then, or do you think that you know we might see him sit in the press box while someone like Setaguchi or Jones draws in regularly? I could see McGratton staying every game, and then Bullig switching off, depending on the team. Like, if we're playing, say, like Edmonton, where they do have a couple of fighters, then have both of those guys in. If not, like, if you're playing a team like Detroit, who's mostly finesse, then put the offensive guy in instead. The only reason I ask about Bullig is... We also have David Wolf on the farm. Now, we don't know what he's actually like as a fighter yet. But I can almost see Bolig and uh, Wolf being interchangeable in a lot of ways there. I think, you know, one of them could slot into the lineup for the other. And I think if. I think David Wolf would have to win it, but I think it's possible David Wolf could win that roster spot with the big team. Yeah, and I agree. I just think that. Wolf's main job is if Gaudreau gets sent to Adirondack at the start of the year, he's McGratton for them. For sure. And you could easily swap those guys. Now, I think Bowling, depending on the time of year, might get taken. That's the only worry I'd have on waivers. Oh, uh, I, I wouldn't waive them. Like, you could trade them if you need to. Because there's yeah. always teams looking for that type of guy. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we need, we definitely need a, a young guy in Adirondack, and I guess I was thinking that Bowley could go up and down, but you're right. In order to do that, we'd have to wave him, and we'd probably lose him. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll revisit these lineups. Uh, save your lineups. We'll revisit these after the final lineups have been put together and see how well we did. See how well we can uh, predict what the Flames are going to do. I think that we're probably going to be right on uh, between the net. I think we're going to be right on defense. I think where we have a little bit of wiggle room this year is the forwards, which I think is pretty cool considering the forwards' depth for the Flames for a number of years has been pretty bad. To have as many options as they do is a good thing. Yeah, and having as many of our own draft picks coming through and actually pushing for jobs is refreshing as, you know, someone that's been a Flames fan for 25 years, and other than Corey Stillman, uh, yeah, not nothing really <laughs> amongst the forwards, so... So, I think we both said uh, we think Berchie's going to make the team, we both think Furlan's going to make the team, and you thought that uh, Bennett might make the team, at least at the start. Yeah, for the very beginning, those three. And who do you think of those three stays with the team for the majority of the year? Obviously, Bennett, you think, goes down. Do you think there's any chance they sign him after nine? I. It would depend. If he has like a Monaghan-type start 
because remember Monaghan had six goals in his first nine games, then I think Bennett would stick all year, or at least a majority of the year. Uh, Berchi, I think he would stick for the entire season, and Furland might... It, it would depend on how he adjusted in the NHL. I think Berchi has too much to lose, personally, not to stick this year. Um, I think Furland has definitely earned that spot, but I can see him going up and down. I could see Reinhardt replacing him at some point. Um, but I there's th- about ten guys really yeah. that could Corbin Knight could jump in there. In. I think that Furland's gonna have to work hard to keep that spot. I could see him giving it to him and saying, "We're giving this spot to you," but you know, it's yours to lose. Everything is changeable. It just depends on who's doing what. Like, who knows? Maybe Bill Arnold takes the AHL by storm and forces his way onto the team in December. You never know. Don't know. And you can change whichever name for whichever yeah. name. And it could happen. So The thing I'm really excited about this year is the fact that Flames have money to play with. I think that between waivers and having some extra um, contracts and having money to play with... I think we're going to see some interesting things. I don't don't get me wrong. I don't think we're bringing in a superstar by any means, but I think you're going to see Tre Living get kind of creative this year. Well, I could see us being kind of the third wheel on a trade potentially at some point where two teams are like right at the cap and they need some relief somehow. I could see us playing a third wheel in that yeah. to eat a contract or something. And that's kind of what I mean by getting creative. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a older player or a player who's perhaps not having a great year but is expensive ending up in a Flames jersey this year because we're doing somebody a favor something and taking like them David off their Jones. hands. Yeah, a player like David Jones, obviously a better deal than David Jones because that wasn't really eating contract. But yeah, a player like David Jones coming in here and you know getting a draft pick or a prospect for our troubles. Are we at the floor now? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we... Put it this way, even if we wave Jones to the farm, because we can only eat 900k of that uh, as a cap exemption, so the remainder of his 4 million would stay on the Flames cap, so... But yeah, I we're good. I wouldn't be surprised to see at some point a player that perhaps isn't the... I guess was the diplomatic way of saying this. Perhaps someone who's not having the greatest year this year ending up in a Flames jersey. But we're going to gain something by doing that. Like you said, being a third wheel or yeah, taking on somebody's bad contract. I thought they were going to do the draft, but I think we'll definitely see it this year. Of Hey, we'll trade this guy to Calgary, then Calgary will immediately turn around, absorb some of their salary and trade them somebody else. And Calgary will keep a prospect for that or something, something along those lines. Yeah. Definitely some options available. Is there a rule about how much of a salary a team can absorb in a trade? Uh, you can only eat 50% of the contract, and I, there is a cap on how many times you can do that. Oh, there is, okay. Or, like, how much percentage of the cap. I can't remember the exact details, but there is a limit. Yeah, I wasn't sure if there's I a limit to how much think you can only do it four times. But four is still a lot. I can't see any team doing it four yeah. times in a year. No. Um, It'd be a little weird if that were to happen. You'd have a very odd roster. It would be like the... Yeah. I can see the Flames doing it once, maybe twice when the deadline comes around. But yeah, I I can't see them... um, Cannot see the Flames doing it four times in one year. No. That'd be a little ridiculous. You'd have to be getting some really good prospects to go to that extent. I mean, depending on who it is, you might say, okay, we're going to take this guy, but we're going to immediately wave him. And somebody could take him for free from us, but we don't want him anyways. And we're going to immediately send him down. But whether we take the guy, I don't think know if we're going to necessarily be a third wheel the way you're thinking. I think we're almost going to be the middleman. I think somebody will end up being a flame for about five minutes. Somebody will trade a guy to the flames. The flames will eat half his salary and trade him back to somebody else. So I think we might make a deal where the guy doesn't actually become a flame this year. But he goes through here. Sort of like the first time we acquired Curtis Joseph. Yes. For 
five minutes and then <laughs> exactly. he became a free agent. Yeah, some but without the free agency, I think or Yeah, you like might that. get like two teams yeah. that are high, they trade a superstar to Calgary, we eat half his salary, trade him off to the team that he's eventually gonna go to, and we get, you know, prospect from both sides for doing it or something. Yeah. That I think I can see that. Yeah, that I think would be more likely because I don't know that we have a lot of extra roster spots to bring somebody in. Especially an older guy, but that's no. that's kind of what I think the Flames might do. Is almost be that broker. Yeah, there's all sorts of options, and plus the ownership said that they are willing to spend to the cap. So maybe they might use some of the cap space just to buy assets, like in the a scenario like you mentioned. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. It will be. That's what'll make the season fun. Well, Matt, we'll, we'll be back next week just as we start the uh, regular season. So enjoy the rest of the training camp. I know you're going to be at a couple games this week, and I'm going to be at a couple games this week. I'm looking forward we'll to it. We'll see how our roster predictions shake down next week. Yeah, hopefully we're, we only miss on one or two guys, not half of the roster. <laughs> if we miss on any defensemen, I mean, besides that seventh spot, if we don't really know who it's going to be, but if we screw up any of the top six defensemen or the, or the netminders... Something has gone wrong in my eyes in terms of evaluating talent here. Yeah. You know, or injuries. Yeah, well, that's and it. We'll, it could, I'll blame it on that. <laughs> sure, yeah, it could be an injury. But, uh, you know, if, if somehow Ordeo makes it into the top two goalies starting the season, somebody really crapped the bed. Yeah. So let, let's hope that we're pretty close on the back end. And the forwards, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I hope you're right about uh, Bennett. I didn't think about the nine-game thing. But we'll see. Yeah. Lots of interesting stories this week. For sure. And next week, next week we'll run down some of those interesting storylines to watch for the first half of the season as well. Have a good one, everyone. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca. 